That's good to remember. When we are representing our God and our Father. Turn in your Bibles, please, to uh, John's Gospel. Are you able to get those slides, Doug? John's Gospel, chapter 14. We're looking uh, for the second time at this uh, following Jesus day by day as disciple makers in this fourth phase of disciple making, which is remain in me. And we, I like the song that Joshua's teaching us, Abide With Me. Is that by uh, uh, Matt Redman in it? Okay. It was John chapter 14. Now stand with me if you would, and we're going uh, to read verses 1 to 7. We're going to start looking at, at this. I told you last week, this is uh, as we were looking at John 13 in the upper room, in the upper room discourse, the experience of Jesus with the disciple. We looked at it again this morning from Mark's gospel. Judas leaves the room to go betray Jesus, and then he unpacks some teaching in 14 and 15 and 16 that we have nowhere else in the New Testament. Uh, and one writer observed that it's, he said, have you ever been in a situation where, where there was somebody in the room that you just, you didn't completely trust, and when they left the room that you felt like you could just breathe easier and, and be yourself? And some of that's going on here, I think. Follow along as I read John 14, verses 1 to 7. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. Or if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. I've got a little funny story. I'm talking to one of our folks is today at the, at the meal, she was telling me one of their children was smaller, that they thought I was saying the inerrant, infallible, artificial Word of God. Um, it's all sufficient. Sufficient because it gives us everything we need for life and godliness. All sufficient because we don't need to really add anything to it to make it complete in his revelation. So just in case there's someone who thinks I'm saying artificial. Thank you. Please be seated. We were looking last week at John 13, and I want to read the end of John 13, which really, really introduces sort of why Jesus goes where he goes in John 14. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Remember, he had just told him, I've given you a new commandment that you love one another as I've loved you, you ought to also love one another. Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, remember what truly, truly, when it comes up in your English versions, that's the Greek word amen, amen. We get our word amen from that, right out of that. Just listen up, pay attention. I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And of course that will happen later on. It's just heart-wrenching when it does. And so it's this... Where are you going? 
And Jesus begins teaching comfort to them. You can imagine they're distressed. He's just told them, I'm not going to be with you that much longer. A little while, you'll no longer see me. That does not fit their thinking concerning his kingdom. How can this thing advance if he goes right in the middle of it, if he leaves right in the middle of it? How can this happen? And so he speaks comfort to them. You hear this passage read. In fact, I read it at every funeral of a believer. It begins, let not your hearts be troubled. And they had troubled hearts. They were, they were grievous. They'd already been grieving. When Jesus said, one of you at the table here is going to betray me, I'm going away. There's a lot of, of grief that they're dealing with here, a lot of confusion, a lot of hurt, a lot of disappointment, a lot of anguish, a lot of anxiety. Do not let your heart be troubled. What's the antidote to a troubled heart? Well, he tells us, believe in God. Believe also in me. He's, he's making these connections. In fact, uh, down in verse uh, 7, from now on you do know him, that is God, and have seen him because of their connection to Jesus. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, right there, folks, he is again identifying himself with the God of heaven, and God is his Father. You heard the, the way that Hebrews pray. We read that this morning when we looked at the Passover material. Sovereign God of the universe, creator of all things. It was, it was, it was revolutionary to consider God, calling God Father. In fact, it was... To the Jewish leaders, it was blasphemous to do so. My father's house are many rooms. Now, just parenthetically, you, you hear this taught, are many mansions, and I'm just looking for a mansion. It's, it's, it's not a cul-de-sac. It's, it's, there's many rooms. They're going to be living in the, uh, in the palatial context of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. If it were not so, I, I, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? In other words, I wouldn't mislead you. And he's trying to help them understand that his, his leaving is a reason for comfort. He's going to intensify this uh, when he gets over in chapter 16 and talks about how he's going to send the comforter. That it's necessary that he goes so that the comforter can come. Fast forward a little bit. When the, when the disciples went out two by two, when the twelve went out, when the seventy went out two by two, they saw great things happen. But when Peter comes out of the upper room on, on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, he is filled with power. He, he is on fire in a way that would have been impossible had Jesus remained. Jesus' departure makes available to all of his followers the indwelling presence of Christ versus the physical presence of Christ. The physical presence of Christ is here and not there. The indwelling presence of Christ in the, purpose of the, in the person of the Holy Spirit is in you and you, and, and Paul says in Colossians, in the midst of all of you, and we're meeting today, and brothers and sisters around the world have met, and they've met in the power and presence of the Spirit it was necessary that he go away. And so he's, he's giving them comfort here. And if I go and prepare a place for you, and I just will again just throw you a little language lesson here, he is not positing a hypothetical when he says, and if I go. In fact, a, a better rendering of that, given the construction of the sentence, is it's called a first class conditional, since I am going. In other words, it's have confidence that I am going. Since I am going then this will happen. Because of this, then this. He's not speaking possibility here. Since I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, 
you may be also. You remember at the resurrection, and then after the resurrection, at the ascension, when they were standing on the Mount of Ascension, and, and they watch him, and they gaze as he, as he is taken up into heaven in this, this incredible uh, transcendence. The ascension. The angel says to them, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus whom you, whom you have seen go into heaven will in like manner return. What he was teaching there was the, the infallible proof of his coming again is what you've just observed, his, his ascending on high. That's proof that he's going to come back. And so Jesus is, is teaching something like that here. As surely as I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. You're, you, you're thinking about me leaving. I'm, I'm thinking in, in long terms, in terms of expanding your witness capacity and then returning for you, having prepared a place for us to dwell together eternally. You're thinking at the end of your nose. I'm thinking about the consummation of the age. And there's, there's a real difference there. And so we have this, these words of comfort And then Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas, he just, he was, he's a lot like you and me, really. He just, Lord, I, help me, I'm, I'm at a loss here. We do not know where you're going. You see, Peter's already asked, where are you going? And Jesus didn't tell him where he was going initially. He tells him that he can't come now, but he will come ultimately. So Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. And he's talking about in the, in the Father's house, this is language that is, again, not something they would be familiar with, accustomed to, comfortable with. How can we know the way? In other words, Lord, you're talking to us as if we know things we don't know. And Jesus keeps bringing them back. It's, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Look at this. Jesus said to him, I am the way. If you know me and you follow me, you'll be on the way. I am the way and the truth. Believe in God, believe also in me. You've got to believe me. And the life. You want life, you value life, you've got to, you've got to know me. You've got to believe me. You've got to follow me. You've got to make it about me. You've got to be content to know me and, and, and disabuse yourself of this, of this discontentment that wants to know what's behind door number one, door number two, and door number three. If you know me, Jesus is teaching, you know enough. If you had known me, see the emphasis here? You would have known my Father also. In other words, if you had known me as you need to know me and that you should know me, then when I talk about the Father, the connection would be there. And it's just, there's a little bit of a chiding here, but he's really, he's really exhorting them to move beyond the superficial, physical, the sense that we've got to have him physically here present. And, and take, take in with spiritual eyes and spiritual ears what I've been teaching you and get the big picture. And the fact that he's taught them this and that the Holy Spirit will come and, and reveal to them all truth allows him to say from now on, you do know him and have seen him. In other words, th things are going to happen that are going to be a, an increasingly intense revelation of who God is and what his mission is. And the prophecies, like Isaiah's prophecy in 53, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That they will begin to make connections when the Spirit becomes their teacher to all these things that Jesus has taught and all the prophecies he's referenced and all the prophecies they know. They're going to start coming together with, with, a, with a crystal clear focus in Jesus Christ. Now, folks, we're looking back. 
We're looking back. We look back through the lenses of the cross and the resurrection. And when we struggle to think we don't, we don't know where this is going sometime. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We, we don't know if this selling out to Jesus is really going to work. We, it's this thing, we don't, don't know some things. We come back to who we know. But we know Jesus. We remind ourselves of, of who he is. But that's why we preach and we teach and we fellowship and we share and we exhort. That's why we disciple. That's why we get in, in groups of two or three and, and talk about how the Lord has, has moved in the, in the week's journey. What he's teaching you. How you're draw, drawing nearer to him. That's what it was all about for Jesus. So Philip pipes up now. You got, you've had Peter say, where are you going? Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. And it'll be enough. In other words, Jesus, if it, if it hinges on, you just said we'd, we've not, if we'd known the Father, we would have known where you were going. Show us the Father. Help us to know him. And he says, have I been with you so long and you still do not know? You don't know me, Philip? Powerful. Show us the Father. You don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Now stop a minute. What's one of the themes of the high priestly prayer going to be when he prays in John 17? Help them to know that, that I and the Father, that, that we're one, Father. He's praying these things for them in John 17. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority but the father who dwells in me does his works here's the, here's the un, unasked question here to what or to whom do you attribute the works you've seen me do Philip think about it these folks they've seen him heal blind people Lepers, lame. I mean, you start going down the list. They've seen him calm a stormy sea. They've seen him feed multiplied thousands with, a, with a one fellow's lunch. They've, they've even seen, they've seen him raise, that was, interrupt, a, interrupt a funeral to raise a child from the dead. They've seen him breathe over, over uh, Jairus' daughter and raise her. They've seen him most recently call Lazarus forth from the tomb. I mean... Folks, here's the lesson here. Sometimes we get so dialed in to the events of Scripture that we don't make the connection that Jesus was constantly revealing the Father. He's going to say, if you love me, You'll keep my commandments. Where do you get his commandments from? From the Father. He, he says here, I don't, I don't do anything. He says in another place, I don't say anything except what the Father tells me to say. Do you not believe, verse that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. In other words, I've taught you this. 
This has been a part of my, the fancy word is peripatetic teaching. I have, I have walked in the way with you and I've pointed out earthly realities and, and taught you heavenly truths. But if my teaching you, pressing upon you and insisting in your midst that I and the Father are one, that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, that I have come from the Father. Now, brothers and sisters, let's, let's give the disciples some slack here. What he's talking about is part of the reality of the Trinity, of wrapping your head around how, how can there be God, who is Father, Jesus, who is Son, the Holy Spirit, who is the Comforter, three persons, one God. We sing it, holy, holy, holy. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Oh, that's wonderful. And we have to just say there's mystery here. So we come back to Jesus taught this. And I don't have to understand it. It doesn't have to make sense to me. Uh, one uh, one pro very prominent, very popular uh, teacher has recently said that, that if we're going to reach this culture, we've got to go beyond Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so. He says this Bible tells me so mentality will not reach this culture. And it's really tragic to read what he said. and He should know better. But folks, all we have to go on is the word. Jesus appeals to that. My words. He says in John 8, if you continue in my words, if you abide in my words, and my words abide in you, then you will, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. And he's left us this. This is his word. All the Old Testament, he said, testifies of him. All the New Testament is written to reveal him. I think the Puritans had a saying. They said, the New, the New Testament, is in the Old concealed. In other words, the truths of the New Testament are all there in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is by the New revealed. This is why, by the way, I think that the life transformation groups make much of reading uh, lots of Scripture. Pouring over the Word of God. Chapter after chapter after chapter to read. And as you read, pray, Lord, show me Jesus Christ. Show me Jesus Christ. So he says, if you, if you won't believe my words, then believe, believe the works, tie the works that I do back to the Father and believe that I and the Father are one. I'm in him and he's in me. And then he says in verse, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And then here, this is more comfort, and greater works than these will he do. Why? Because I'm going to the Father. See, they heard going as reason to be disappointed and discouraged and, and, and see tragedy. He's trying to convince them that going is going to be beneficial. So he talks about the marks of one who believes in him, will also do the works that I do, and he's talking about the power to do it. And greater works than these will he do. And then he gives this, this amazing promise to those contextually now. You can rip it out of context, it doesn't mean anything. Contextually, believe in God, believe also in me. Believe that my, my departure is for your good and for the good of many. Believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. Believe that the Father and I are one. That the Father is wise and he would not harm you. He, he's, he's taking me out of here for your good and for his glory. So it, it's all of that. Live a life that reflects Jesus Christ. You know, it, it, it got kind of trivialized 
years ago, the, the bracelet. It's, it's kind of a shame because I think behind it was a, was a real sincere emphasis. What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus would never ask what's wrong with it. Jesus always asked, does this glorify my Father? Does this exalt my name? Does it advance the gospel? Is it really for the good of souls? What would Jesus do? And that's what he's pressing here, really. And, the, and in that context, the, the people who embrace and take him on, on his terms, according to his word, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. Here's the purpose. Why does Jesus answer our prayer? And this is one of those clauses. Those in order that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So that ought to shape our prayer, shouldn't it? There's things we can pray that really don't bring glory to God. We can, you can ask a lot of things in the name of God that won't bring glory to God. But those things we pray that have as the focus, Lord, be glorified. Get glory unto yourself by magnifying Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I'm all over that. You can pray, you can ask that, and, and it will happen. And it really ought to shape our prayer life. It would, uh, and as our prayer life changes, we've talked about this, as our prayer life changes, then our actions change. And now he gets into this, this next section here. We want to just kind of move through this tonight. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. See, if, well, I love Jesus, really. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He's just given them this new commandment, which we, which we taught you when we looked at that last week, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. It's, it's one of the marks of how the world will become convinced, where the gospel becomes a compelling witness from the church when the world sees the love that we have for one another and the love for God, that it's compelling to believe the gospel. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Get the progression here. I'm going. We don't know where you're going. Jesus said, you know me. That's enough. If you know me, it ought to be enough. If you know me, well, I want to know the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. If you love me, do you get the impression that for Jesus, and this is not egocentric on his part, because this is God's agenda. For Jesus, it's all about him. If we make it about anything else, about us, about this, about that, about it's all about him. And for those who, who show their love for me beyond words, it's not just word, love in word, but love in deed, Then he will ask the Father. Hold that for just a minute and go over to 1 John chapter 5. Just real quickly, I want you to see this. First John chapter 5. I want to try to read this to you, verse 1, with a movement of the verb tenses here to get a 1 John 5 1. Everyone who is believing who continues believing that Jesus is the Christ, has been born of God. I appreciate so much the English Standard Version here because it gives you the has been born of God. So the one continually believing is, is evidencing that he has been, that in the past has had the new birth experience. And everyone who is loving the Father is loving whoever has been born of the Father. By this we know that we are loving the children of God when we are loving God and obeying his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. 
And his commandments are not burdensome. That's what I wanted to get to. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. I want to bring you right back to John 14, 1. Believe in God, believe also in me. It becomes a measure of faith. James said it this way. You say you have faith, I say I have works. Show me your faith by your works. I'll show you my, my faith by my works. You say you don't have works, I say your faith's dead. I mean, that's, that's all he was after was, a, was an evidenced faith, not a faith based on works. It's, it's the uh, one writer said that faith, that, that works are the fruit, not the root of faith. Faith is anchored in the shed blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the evidence that there is true saving faith, and it's not just not notional faith, is a commitment to obey him. And so you should see in that, if you're familiar with the children's catechism, how do we glorify God? By loving him and doing what he commands. It's right there. Everyone who's been born of God, verse 4, is overcoming the world. And this is the victory that is, has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes, is believing that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, folks, you may not have realized this, but this is, this is what he's pressing upon them. Judas has left the room, and now he is, he is really digging deeply into, into their souls. Now this ought to be, they ought to be ready to learn this. Because you see, someone who's been with them the three, the three and a half years that, that he journeyed has just walked out of the room to go betray him. Clearly it's not enough just to be identified with him. Clearly it's not even enough to hear him teach. Judas qualified in both those categories. So now he connects true love to a commitment to obey him, his commandments. Now, I hope you noticed when I read 1 John 5, it talked about obeying God's commandments. Jesus says, who keeps my commandments? Have you found anything in the scripture that would lead you to believe that God has a set of commandments and Jesus has a different set of commandments? The reason I ask that is I know preachers that teach that. That God's got his 10 commandments and Jesus has got something else. I don't, I don't see that, I don't see how that, you could even come up with that. I mean, I know how they do, but it's, you can't do it with an open Bible. He and the Father are one. Everything he says, the Father tells him to say. Everything he does, the Father tells him to do. Every work he's done is, is the Father. How could you believe that when Jesus talks about loving him by keeping his commandments, and John, who... In his letter, the same guy that wrote this gospel talks about obeying God's commandments could be thinking about two different bodies of truth. It's not, it's not reasonable. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice the change there. I don't know if you understand the, the, the mystery of the Spirit's uh, hovering and, and indwelling, but in the Old Testament, you had this, the reality of the Spirit. He would, he would come upon and anoint people for service. He did that for Saul the king. Do you remember what happened to Saul the king when he, when he became disobedient to God? God withdrew his spirit. Do you remember what Saul looked like when God withdrew his spirit? He became a madman. Do you remember what happened to David when David committed adultery with Bathsheba and in Psalm 51 he is crying out for mercy. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. Blot out my transgressions. What does he say in the midst of that? And take not your Holy Spirit from me. But something changes. He has been with you, Jesus says. 
And He will be in you. And what is necessary for that to happen? For Jesus to go away. He's got to leave. He's got to depart. And He and the Father will together, uh, the great uh, confessions, speaking of the, the Apostles' Creed, the Holy Spirit who from the Father and the Son proceeds. He proceeds from eternally from the Father and the Son. He dwells with you. They'd seen the power of the Spirit when they went out two by two. And He will be in you. I will not leave you, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. He's, gonna, he's talking about the immediate fulfillment of that and then the long-term fulfillment of that. For example, he, he made some post-resurrection appearances where they saw him. He, he appeared on the road to, to Emmaus uh, and the two disciples who were grieving over his departure or over his death saw him. But then there's the long term where he will, he will be seen. Every eye will see him. And identify with him as Lord. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Because I live, you also will live. That's interesting because he's been talking about his death, being betrayed, departing. And yet he's teaching that in, in all of that, think of me as living. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And when you can't read that, brothers and sisters, without thinking about John 17 when he prays that. And again, whoever has my commandments, not talking about one who knows about them, but in other words, whoever, whoever is operating actively with my commandments as, as in the forefront of his agenda and keeps them. And the word keep there is not to, to perfectly keep so as never to disobey. It is to treasure. You can actually read it this way. Whoever holds on to my commandments and treasures them. He it is who loves me. He's back to the same theme in the early verses. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas says, not Iscariot, Iscariot's gone. The other Judas says, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? His answer should not surprise you at this point. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. How? In, in the Gospel of John, in the prologue, the beginning of it, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, dwelt, lived among us. We beheld his glory. How's, he, how's the Father and the Son going to make their home with these folks he's talking to now? As the Spirit comes to indwell them. He will take up residence in the heart, in the life. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Now, he's flipped it now. How do you know you love him? You have a heart to obey. How do you know you don't love him? You treat his words lightly. Oh, yeah, I know all that. I... I I wish I had a dime for every time somebody said, well, I, re I know, the, I, I believe the Bible and all that stuff. And I say, what stuff? What stuff? Let's, let's get beyond the book as a book and tell me what's, what stuff do you believe? You see? Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. It's, it's one of the measures, one of the marks. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. He is still answering this, show us the Father. And he says, hey, if you, you don't realize that I and the Father are one? These things I've spoken to you, this is verse 25, 
while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Now, if they could take that in at that moment, it, it should have been very comforting to them because they're just missing, they're missing things left and right. He's going to come. He's going to teach you. He'll be your teacher. The word uh, used when it's talking about comfort or hearing things, the uses earlier is, is, a, is a compound word, parakaleo. You may see it spelled out in English sometimes, paraclete, not parakeet, paraclete with an L. And it's one who, who, who comes alongside para, kaleo, and who calls to the person. Now, if you've walked with the Lord any amount of time at all, you have known that alongside calling. Those times when you've doubted whether God loves you and this, this spirit who is alongside you, the comforter who dwells in you, says, He's Abba. Abba loves you. He's for you. Nothing can be effective eternally against you. He's the one who comes alongside and he teaches. And, and let's, let's just, there is, there is inspiration, there's revelation, and there's illumination. Inspiration is literally, uh, when, when Paul says, Timothy, all scripture is inspired by God. The Latin there is inspiro, it's, it's breathed. It literally means all scripture is God breathed. So that's inspiration. That it's, it's, its source, its author is God. Revelation is, is not, not the book, Revelation, but, but it, is the, it is the act of God unveiling it. When the scales fall off our eyes in the new birth, so that we see, we, we, I've told you about Pilgrim's Progress before, and, and when hopeful and and Christian are having the conversation. Uh, they've come out of the celestial. They've come out of uh, of uh, Vanity Fair, and and Faithful's been martyred in Vanity Fair. And Hopeful sees Faithful's uh, martyring and the way he receives death in the name of the Lord, and it it's, impacts him. And Hopeful is converted, and so they're making their journey. And and so Christian asks him, "How came you to walk in the way that you now walk? In other words, how did you come to be a Christian?" And so he tells him this wonderful story. I've, I've encouraged you, exhorted you to read it sometimes. The conversion of Hopeful. And when he gets through, Christian says, that was a revelation to your soul indeed. In other words, that, what, a, what a wonderful unveiling of, in, of, of the Lord to show you his mercy and his grace. Revelation. Illumination. See, sometimes we say, well, I, I had a revelation. No, that's, that's final in the inspired document. Illumination is what we experience. That's what he's talking about here. The Spirit will lead you into all truth. He will illumine you. And you've experienced that. If you study the Word at all, if you read the Word at all, there have been those times. In fact, I would, I would venture to say you could, you could raise your hand tonight and say, yes, I read over a passage recently that I've read before and something came out to me that I'd really never seen before. That's illumination. Best example I ever heard of illumination was if you go into a, if you go into a uh, cave, a dark cave, Carlsbad Cavern, or one of these caves, stygian darkness where you can't see anything. You put your hand right there, you can't see anything. And someone strikes a match, and you begin to darkness begins to be pushed out, and you see shadowy things. And someone takes the match and touches it to a torch, and, and then the torch drives back even more darkness, and and you begin to see these things taking shape. You begin to see the stalactites. I know they're stalactites because. They're the ones that hang from the ceiling. That's why the word tight is a good reminder for that. The stalagmites, the things that come up from the, from the ground. And you go, wow, who moved those stalagmites in here? When did they do that? So no, they, they've been here the whole time. You've just had more light. You've been illumined. That's what Jesus said the Holy Spirit will do when he comes. He will, he will lead you into, into all truth and he will bring to your remembrance the things that I've taught you. And brothers and sisters, that's what our entire lives as Christians, once the, once the scales fall off and we see Jesus Christ as the glory of God shown for sinners, the rest of our days 
we're being illumined unless we sit in the darkness and do not bring the light to bear. Darkness does not overcome light. It never has. But darkness functions very well in people who are content to sit in darkness. So he's talking about the illumining work, illumining work of the Holy Spirit. So he will come, he'll bring the remembrance, and then he begins to wrap up this chapter. Now, remember how he started it? Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me. So I, he's, he's saying, take, remove the troubling from your heart. What would a heart look like where trouble has been removed? Wouldn't it be peace? Peace. I leave with you. Peace, my peace, I give you. Verse 27. Not as the world gives do I give to you. In other words, the peace I'm talking about is that peace that Paul talks about later on, this peace that passes understanding. It's the world offers a peace. Uh, do this, enjoy this, um, stay away from this, you know, take advantage of this, but it's temporary. It's, it's, it's not substantial. It doesn't continue because you see, if you anchor your peace in the world's ways and the world's circumstances and the world's people, those things are always shifting. In fact, I'll say this, if you, if you count on having your peace in your spouse's conduct, you're going to be disappointed. Because you married a sinner and your spouse married a sinner. But if you move beyond that to Jesus Christ who offers peace, my peace, I give unto you. Not like the world, so he's, he's going to do this again in, fact, in, in John 17. I'm praying for them and I'm not praying for the world. He makes this clear contrast so that you should not be mistaken. Let not your hearts be troubled. He's back to verse 1. Neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, the idea there, not that they don't love him at all, but if they loved him as they should love him, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. You remember the times in the Gospels they would get up and go looking for him? And where had he been all night? Praying. Fellowship with the Father. Because you see, he, in, in the limitations that were his physical body, he missed that face-to-face -face fellowship with the Father. You should rejoice that I'm going back to my Father. The Father is greater than I am. You should, you should rejoice any time one who is greater than I am is valued and treasured and loved. And now I have told you before it takes place so when, that when it does take place, you may believe. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Treating you as friends, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you ahead of time, it's not, it's not easy to hear. You know, the, the pronouncement from a doctor that you have cancer and it's terminal and, and, and they don't have the wherewithal and the means to heal it is painful to hear. But to not know it, it's a whole different sort of pain. I've told you ahead of time. So that when it happens, when what I've told you, when it does, you may believe. Because what would be the temptation? In fact, what was the temptation? I mean, they scattered. They, knowing all of this, they still ran and fled and hid. And Peter gave up. I'm going back to fishing, he said. So had he not told them these things, 
What can we have hoped for? You see, folks, remember, these are, the, these are the final hours where he is pouring the last bit so that when he comes to pray in John 17, I have finished the work you, kept, you gave me to do. And he hasn't hung on the cross yet. He's getting them ready with these final teachings. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He's talking about, talking about the coming of Satan and the person of Judas to, to finally betray him, to turn him over to the authorities. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise. Let us go from here. And he's going to, in the next chapter we look at, he's going to deal with the whole vine and branches imagery. The idea of union and communion. That's, so you watch what he's doing. He's moving from, from not a superficial knowledge, but a, but, a, but a deep knowledge, experiential knowledge, to, a, to an abiding. He's going to teach them not to be surprised when the world hates them. Because you see, in the, in the world they lived until Jesus came on the scene, if the religious leaders despised you, you were toast. You didn't have a prayer. You had to stay in their good graces because if they wrote you off, then in their minds, heaven had written you off. He's going to tell them ahead of time, the world's going to hate you, but remember, it hated me first. And he's going to talk more about the work of the Holy Spirit who comes to, to convince the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He's going to promise them that though they're going to face great sorrow, that that will turn to joy. He's going to encourage them to believe that, that when they see him seemingly the, the victim, that he is really the victor, he's overcome the world. And then that glorious high priestly prayer. We're going to look at these, Lord willing, in the coming Sunday nights to wrap up uh, this remain in me. And I hope, you're, I hope you're getting a sense of what does it mean to remain in him? To believe him based on his word. To commune with him. To fellowship with him. Not to doubt him. When we doubt him, folks, we tear a little bit of the fabric of remaining, of abiding. We're going to look at more of this whole idea of abiding. So my exhortation to you as we close tonight, whatever's going on in your life, if you belong to Jesus Christ, if you're really a follower of Christ, let not your heart be troubled. The antidote to whatever we're facing is to believe in God and believe in Jesus who he sent. You see, it's not rocket science. We don't have to figure out a lot of things. Just believe in God. Believe in Jesus. And then, love him. And as evidence that we love him, obey his commands. And not kid ourselves. We, anybody we know, who says, well, I love him, but doesn't keep his commandments. John says, and 1 John is a liar. He, he's just a liar. Jesus says, he who doesn't love me doesn't keep my commandments. And let's be sure as folks who love Jesus Christ that we're obeying him. And I'll close with this. And the last commandment he gave before he ascended into heaven was make disciples of all the people groups. Do we love him? Do we love him on his terms? If you love me, you keep my commandments. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, this 14th chapter just of John just warms our hearts and helps put some things into perspective. And yet, Lord, we can, i got to confess, I see myself in that. I, I see attitudes sometimes like, like Peter had in the end of 13, and Thomas had, and Philip had. And I don't want to be dull. I don't want to be spiritually dim-witted. I, I want to embrace what my Savior taught. I want to love you by keeping your commandments. I want to show my love for him by keeping his commandments. I want to abide in him. 
Have his word abide in me. I want to know the power of this promise that prayer will be answered when it's asked, when the petitions are set forth in such a way that you will be glorified in your Son. So help me to embrace more wholeheartedly more tangibly, more obviously, the path, the way of being a disciple maker who makes disciple makers, which when we distill following Jesus day by day, when we distill it down to its essence, that's really what he would have us do. It is the mark that we love you. It's the mark that we love him. It's the mark that we love others. It's the greatest service we can show to a sin-sick, hurting, hell-bound world. Hear our prayer. Answer it according to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.